from the dark web to your radio dial. You are listening to CyberTalk Radio on News 1200 WOAI. Welcome to CyberTalk Radio. I'm your host, Brett Pyatt, a 20-year internet security veteran. And this week, uh, we're talking about a new startup in town. And by town, I mean the city of San Antonio and the greater kind of 1200 WAI listening audience here, which is, depending on how well the radio waves are bouncing around this evening, uh, somewhere between two and a half and five million, maybe even eight million uh, folks out there could be uh, listening to this program. So we're out there on AM. If you're listening to us on 1200, uh, thank you very much for doing so. If you happen to hop out of your automobile and you do not have the uh, iHeart streaming app on your phone, go ahead and add that iHeart streaming app. You can listen to 1200 uh, anywhere you go, uh, in and out of your car and uh, uh, on and around just uh like any other music streaming service there uh, on that iHeart app uh, as well as a number of uh, their other stations uh, out there. So it gives you a chance to uh, listen to uh, all the live radio that you like to uh, while you're in your car uh, anywhere else. If you are listening to us on that streaming app, thank you very much for doing that. And then as well, if you uh, are not going to be able to stick with us today, uh, check out our website at www.cybertalkradio.com or look up Cyber Talk Radio on any of your favorite podcasting services. Uh, this program uh, will be archived uh, there. It'll go up uh, on our website on Tuesday, May 21st, and it'll be there along with uh, the past uh, couple years of, of episodes we have, so you can uh, learn all about uh, cybersecurity startup ecosystem. And today, uh, we're going to be talking uh, lead gen automation uh, with Spencer Farmer, who's the CEO of Cliently. Thank you for joining us, Spencer. Appreciate it, Brett. Yeah. And, and so you go, well, what does lead gen automation have to do with cybersecurity? Well, uh, we'll, we'll get a little twist into this, but if you're out there starting a cybersecurity business, uh, what everyone's going to figure out is, well, every business should be buying cybersecurity. It's difficult to figure out who the person at that company is that's going to make a decision about it and then how to get in front of them at that correct moment in time. So this is an important thing for any entrepreneur to get some idea about. We'll, we'll get to, to hear uh, some of uh, Spencer's story, but for those listeners new to the program, uh, we, we cover education around cybersecurity and then actual cybersecurity products, but then all the things as well that if you're going to start a cybersecurity business, you need to know a little bit about. Uh, you need to understand some of the stuff. So we've had on uh, folks from uh, in investment firms. Uh, we've had uh, people on talking about uh, all sorts of different things that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur. So check out those those past episodes. Uh, but uh, here today, we're going to dig in a little bit uh, to uh, Spencer, his story, and uh, how you ended up in San Antonio as well, because uh, you're new to town right now. I've been here for about 10 or 11 months, so moved here just, I think, at the uh, beginning of July. Okay. So you survived summer number one. Survived summer number one. My uh, wife, who is also uh, actually part of our company, her biggest hesitation to moving to Texas was the uh, was the heat. Yeah. Uh, I got her down here in, I want to say, March or April before uh, the heat hit. So we were lucky in that respect. Uh, we went and stayed uh, around uh, the Alamo, visited the Pearl, and was able to convince her. And, yeah. And now we're That's right great. Here. Well, yeah, welcome to town. And, uh, Thank you. Welcome to our, our thriving kind of tech block, um, tech startup scene here in the, the downtown corridor. Yeah, I've seen a lot of changes uh, just in the period that I've been here and also even a few months prior uh, getting to uh, visit around uh, the area of Geekdom, where I know is the major startup scene here. Uh, just being around Active Capital, which is led um, you know by Pat Matthews and Pat Condon and Kat. Uh, and it's just seemed like it's grown at least 50% just in the last 10 to 11 months. It's great. Yeah, no, it's uh, amazing to be the part of what's going on here, uh, and I, I think this is something that we're we're seeing in many cities across uh, America right now. Is that uh, tech is something that's that's happening everywhere now, uh, not just in two or three big coastal cities anymore. So uh, it's uh, really it, it, I'm enjoying uh, hosting this program here uh, in, and we've we've been on the air now for almost we're working our way to uh, through year number three. Uh, and, and we've done two monologues because I got really upset about something and I wanted to talk about it for a whole hour by myself. Uh, and then we've, we've had a handful of repeat guests, but all um, covering kind of major new things or different topics. It, it's just been amazing to me to see uh, the continued growth of the ecosystem and, and the uh, opportunities we've had to talk with, with folks in the community about it. So on, on Cliently in this whole area of sales automation, marketing automation, how did you, you get involved in this? So, uh, you know, I feel like I'm one of the few startup tech CEOs whose background is actually not in engineering and tech, which makes me a little unusual. It brings some 
great things with it, bring some really uh, difficult things with it. Uh, and so I've done just about every part of the sales process uh, in my career, you know, from the you know, beginning stages of being a, a sales development representative to being an account executive uh, to also being a director and a VP of sales. Uh, and I started off doing that uh, in a few companies uh, completely out of the software space uh, and then slowly moved into a company by accident that uh, is another SaaS. And from doing that, really just learned, uh, you know, not only what it took to have uh, successful lead generation engagement all the way through your sales process, uh, but also how to do that efficiently uh, when you didn't have a lot of resources and putting that together. Uh, and that sort of led to the vision. Yeah. Do you ever work anywhere uh, that you, you said, stop marketing team, we have too many leads? Uh, no. Uh, no. Yeah. No, it's, it's, I, I've never heard that from a sales leader and I've never heard that from a CEO. Yeah, I've heard that from sometimes uh, it, it, when you get into the depths of prospecting, and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, always makes me wonder because I I'll look at it and I'll say, "Hey, if you have too many leads, then you need to start hiring again." Yeah, that's a good problem. It means you're ready for growth. Those but, are high class problems. Exactly. Yeah, there, as, a, as a CEO, if you're ever thinking about complaining, you have too many leads. Now, it's one to to get a whole bunch of of a. Uh, trails of breadcrumbs to go chase down that are are not really a qualified lead not like the, the marketing people should be giving you uh, as my ceo brain where it's a marketing qualified lead it's not yet sales qualified you really haven't had that first real conversation but it should be a real buyer with a real need um and a, like a real person that does want to have a conversation coming out of marketing they should be willing to have that conversation if it's just a list of names and phone numbers and people that maybe could sort of want your product. That's not a lead yet. That's not in, my, not in my book. That's a contact. Correct. I like it. Yeah, exactly right. Uh, so for, for those that have never done all of these roles and, and have thought through all these pieces. So um, as we were talking a little bit before we got on the air. So there's like millions of small businesses in America. So if you're a, a software as a service business and you're selling B2B to these millions of small businesses, so there's folks you don't even have contact information for. Then there's people you have contact information for. And like there's ways you can get that, like buying a list. Is that a good idea? Buying a list without knowing what to do with it? No. I no. mean, first off, there's, you know, I could spend an hour just talking about data and the quality of it, but. We won't go down that route. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of having the data, that's just step one. And right now we're in a, an age where you can get data pretty easily. The quality is still important. But from there, it's knowing what to do with it. Because if you don't know what to do with it, and there's many things that you can do with it, in many levels you have to look at that. It's not just, okay, how do I start my outreach? It's also, what is my messaging? Yeah. What is my value prop? What is the potential pain? Who is the target and why are they the target? And until you figure those things out, having a list, you know, constantly here, well, we just bought a list of 10,000 and we got nothing from it. Just from hearing that, I don't know if it's the, the list or it has, you know, yeah, a bevy the of business. other, yeah. the business or a bevy of other areas. Right. Exactly. Uh, so as you go through, so you get contacts and then if the contact wants to talk to a salesperson, I would call that kind of a marketing qualified lead in my world, in my brain. And then after the salesperson's talked to it and the person like the prospect really wants to get a proposal that's kind of sales qualified at that point. Now they're into a proposal or doing a trial or something else. Then you've got folks that are kind of testing and trialing the product on their way to a customer. Uh, for So with Cliently, kind of where do you guys plug into this and like what pain point did you see that you're like, I, I have to solve this. The, the world is not doing this right. Sure. So. Let me take you back to the, the position I had before this. I was uh, the first employee uh, in the U.S. for a company called PandaDoc. Uh, it was my first uh, role at a tech startup. Uh, and in terms of you know outbound lead generation, to do that process, literally I had to look at this. Okay, number one, I've got to find the contacts. And it's become a little easier than it was four, five, six years ago, but it's number one. Two, I've got to make sure the data is good. Great, now I've got to take that data and scrub it somehow. Three, I've got to create messaging somewhere and I've got to then upload that from my data. Okay, now four, I've got to then also be able to track and stop it if they engage with my sales team and push it somewhere, five, et cetera, et cetera. And so I understood how to put those pieces together semi-automated, but it was still a mess. Yeah. Uh, and that's where I saw the biggest issues in the market because most people either A, they don't know how to do that, B, even if they do, they don't have the time if they're a small business. Uh, and so that was really what we were aiming to solve at the beginning was to help small businesses 
which a lot of times have great services or products and don't make it because they don't have the other half. They do not know how to position it, do not know how to get it out there to their target audience. That was our initial uh, sort of vision. Uh, what it's also now sort of veered into is the second half of that equation, which is getting into the sales cycle. And if you think about you know, some of the other companies out there that are in a space we like to call sales engagement, uh, the big ones, outreach.io, sales loft, we've started to get into that space a little bit as well because yes, you need to engage and you need to find new contacts to hopefully become a lead, but it's just as important when you're working them through that sales process to take them all the way to the finish line. Yeah. I mean, I heard from the HubSpot guys, I can just blog and then like create great content and then people will read my content and sign up for my mailing list. And then if I buy HubSpot, it's just all automated. So that I look at more as marketing and awareness, yeah. which is great. But that's sometimes where people uh, look at sales and marketing and don't understand there's, there's a difference. Um, they definitely work with each other. Uh, but really, you know, our goal when we talk about the outbound piece, our initial vision was to help you find very targeted contacts that would not have found you through your content in HubSpot, would not have found you through your Google AdWords or wherever else you were marketing or advertising. Uh, and the reason that's so important is, especially when you're a young company and you have limited resources, you know, do we know that HubSpot content, do we know that Google AdWords and Facebook, do they work? Absolutely. But at the same time, you have to have a pretty large budget because you can only point it so narrow. When you're doing outbound, you're able to literally target someone that you can almost call if they're willing to talk to you right off the, you know, right out of the gate, a marketing qualified lead because you know it's the right type of company based on industry, size, et cetera. You know it's even the right contact based on the person you're reaching out to, whether that's a director of sales, it's the CFO, whatever it might be. And so the key, th the key thing about that is you're able to really you know, take your scope specifically at the person you're trying to reach who may have never found you or heard of you uh, from your content. Yeah. Now I, I, I joke a little bit. I mean, so it, step one on like out there, if you're working on it, writing high quality content is challenging and, and, and building an audience is challenging. Like you go look out at Twitter and you look at, at all the content that's coming out there. And some people have a lot of followers. Um, but you might find somebody else that you look at that they're creating the same witty, funny, engaging content that somebody else is. And they have a, uh, a hundred times less followers than the other person. So like building an audience on the, that marketing side of stuff. And then the whole uh, drip campaign, marketing automation, um, not personalized contact and outreach. Um, I find it is challenging, uh, to, to really get someone to come all the way through to a buying decision, um, by just hitting them up with automated messaging, unless you're selling flowers the week before Mother's Day to moms, then you might be able to run a drip campaign on somebody. And if they see that email for a special on Saturday afternoon, when it says you can still deliver set flowers to your mom on Sunday morning, uh, then you may make a sale in that sort of way. But for for a B two B solution, especially if you're selling somebody a cybersecurity solution, I mean, like you're having a conversation about trust. And you really have to talk to the right person at the right time and build the right relationship. So starting with what you mentioned in terms of, you know, building an audience, and that comes really, I look at that more of, from the marketing side as well, Yeah, is you're right, that's really tough. And even if you have great content, et cetera, you know, someone might have 10 times the audience as you. But forgetting all that for a second, even when you have a great audience there, they might not be your key fit all the time. And obviously, if it's about cybersecurity, you're not going to have someone that's into uh, baseball analytics uh, that's going to be listening to it, but you might have somebody who is a sales development rep or something like that uh, at a company listening to it, and that's not your ideal target either. So at the end of the day, you're still you're going to get some you know something that's really great from from that you know, but then you're going to get a lot that's not, and that's why outbound targeting is so important. Now talking about the second piece you mentioned, uh, you know everybody always talks about a book called Predictable Revenue, uh, written yeah. by you know one of the uh, either was co-founders of Salesforce or early director or head of sales there. Uh, and, you know, at that time, that worked really well. And actually, I still believe in that methodology, but there's it's evolved. And here's what we do that's different and why it's important. So it was all about, you know, when you're creating an outbound funnel, which makes it uh, something that you can actually look at a scientific basis, is that you can say, all right, we know that if we send off to this many people, we're going to get this many potential contacts 
uh, or actually contacts that turn into what we call leads. And then from there, we can say, all right, when we have those conversations, and I'm, I'm just giving you a very vague overview because you can have 10 different steps, but let's just yeah. call it three. The third one is we're going to close 10% or 20%, right? And so that model still holds true. The difference now is 15 years ago, emails got through to people. Yeah. Now they don't. The average person, you know, from a business, a B2B perspective, probably gets anywhere from 50 to 100 emails a day. Even if they wanted to, they couldn't spend time reading each one. And so now really the biggest issue and what we were trying to solve is, especially for smaller businesses that have, you know, amazing services and products is how do I cut through the noise? And so what we did is we started looking at other ways that would get people to engage, to see our message. And so what we initially implemented is video messaging and then some of the older elements, physical mail, handwritten notes, postcards. And again, you can use these things and break them down to a science of why is this going to engage people? Yeah. Well, if you talk about emails, there's 50 to 100 they get a day. Let's call it 100 just for, for this scenario. Video messages. It's becoming a little bit more adopted, but still, let's call that one a week. So yeah. now you're the guy that sent them, you're the only guy that sent them a video and a, uh, you know, and uh, an email. Then if you start to add the postcard or the handwritten note, the physical pieces, which people know they work, but they just take too much time. You can't scale that if you're trying to do it on your own. Well, now you're the only person that sent them a video, a handwritten note, etc. Now that doesn't mean that they're going to sit there and say, Oh, I love your product, but you already know that the right target and now you've got their attention. So yep. now of course your messaging now, still has to be. Now it's right. on your salesperson. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, no, I, I think it, it's great. And like, as you go through, uh, for, for those out in the audience trying to figure out how to market to somebody like me. So I'm a cybersecurity CEO for by day radio host by, by night or by afternoon, depending on when we, uh, pull these programs together. Uh, and, so by default, if you email me and, and you have a, an image based email, I don't have images turned on. Like I, and if, unless I know you, that email is just getting deleted. Um, you're not going to get any tracking data out of it. My, my open receipts and red receipts are turned off. Um, and the tracking pixel never showed up because it never loaded because images are turned off in my email. So you, you, you would get no feedback from me whether I even looked at your email or not, um, unless I knew you. Uh, so like tip to send me is, is send a, a text based thoughtful message that says, you know, who I am and something else. Um, uh, but it send me a handwritten note, um, and says, Hey, um, sent you a video that, that I believe is uh, appropriate for the problem you're trying to solve right now. Uh, you may get me to go back through my inbox and, and cause I can pull it up on my phone still like, well, emails get deleted. They don't really ever go away these days either. So I can end up pulling that message back up and watching it. And as you said, those kind of multiple touch points and the multiple form factors creates a, a real relationship of trust, which is what uh, folks are, are looking for um, out there today because uh, there's so many services to choose from. And it's like, how do you decide who I can trust and who's real? That is actually a big way that we describe video because exactly where – you know, people are hiding behind content and I don't know where you are, who you are, etc. And so just the fact that I can see you and hear you already adds a layer of credibility. You know, of course, I can potentially go to your LinkedIn profile. Having that helps too. But being able to hear you and see you uh, makes a big difference uh, from a credibility standpoint. But then also the second piece is from an emotional standpoint. Uh, if you think about the, you know, right now we're in an age where people are doing more and more business with people they never meet. But if you think about it still, the highest close rates of doesn't matter if it's somebody buying a VC, you know a DVD player or I was almost going to say VCR but a DVD yeah. player which is well, that's almost extinct now too. That's pretty uh, much yeah. But uh, DVD player or buying you know software as a service, uh, when you meet that person in person, the close rate goes up significantly. So video doesn't do quite that, but it gives you a layer of that because now again the credibility number one and two the emotional piece where they're able to. Uh, see you, hear you, inflection in your tone, tell a story makes a difference. And that's a big part of why people buy in person. Yeah. So uh, as you uh, have been uh, gotten started on this and, and gotten going, um, it, at some point here, you, you got your first customer. So you, you guys are a customer of your own product? Like, were you your own first customer? So, you know, as I mentioned, it, it, there, there's pros and cons about being a CEO that is yeah. sales background. I literally was still at my last company. I put uh, something up on Product Hunt. Are you familiar with it? Yeah, yeah. Or I'm, and if your audience, if you've not heard about it and you're into looking at stuff that's coming out, you should go check it out. So it's really, though, more of a let's give you feedback and a looky-loo type of audience. Yeah. And I put up 
you know, I put something up on product hunt and we had a thousand dollars of revenue within four or five days. And so that was something where my CEO said, Hey, I saw that you had a launch. Congratulations. And, uh, two weeks later, I, you know, gave my notice. Yeah. Um, so the first sale came right away. My issues, you know, if you want to talk about, you know, startup founders and always having issues were no different. Ours were on the development side, not having that background and not having the right person until about a year ago on my team from that perspective, which I'll, I'll talk about in a moment, uh, our new CTO. But that was the biggest issue. It was being able to follow up on the implementation side of the philosophy that we knew was something people were already interested in. Yeah. No, it's it, it's the, the yin and the, the yang. Uh, no matter what happens inside your business, you're going to have problems. Like you have too many people signing up and you can't do delivery or you've built a great platform and you can't reach people and get the message out to them. Yeah, it's never we built exactly the right platform with exactly the right scale for exactly the right number of customers that are coming in today. That if, if there's anyone out in our listening to audience that that's that is the case, your business is just perfect all the time. Um, I would love to have you on the the program, and I'm going to ask questions until we you you either exhaust me or we we find out that you live in a fairy tale land. One of the two. Yeah, and I mean, so the last company I was a part of, and not to say it didn't have its own trial and tribulations, it had a, a product that wasn't that great before it was able to launch its its current product called PandaDoc. They had all of those major pieces filled. They had me from the sales side. They had a great marketing guy. They had a amazing CTO. And then they had a CEO who's extremely charismatic who was able to go out and find investment. And that's sort of, and they're, they went from, you know, nothing to a hundred million dollar company in about four years. And, you know, there's some others that have done that as well, but not as many as you'd think. No. And it was because I really believe we had all of those parts filled. And most of the time you don't, we didn't from the development side. And a lot of the companies we speak to, the biggest piece that they're missing is that sales side. Yeah. And so we're trying to help solve at least a small part of that because we know how difficult it is if you don't have that role filled or if you don't have the right sort of process in place. Yeah, no, for for sure. So, uh, you you got your your first chunk of customers there. Started quit your day job. Started scrambling to service those customers. At what point did you decide it was right to go talk to investors and and try to get some money to actually uh, help you fund this thing? Because even though when it, look early on, anyone out there in business, um, it's super challenging to make money day one in a business. Even if you're running a consulting company, build up six months of nest egg before you go start your consulting company. Uh, but if you're going to build a, a product company like this, you're going to likely either be spending a lot of your own money for quite a while, um, or you're going to be spending somebody else's money that you bring in as investors. So I would say within the first, you know, four to six months, I was already thinking about it. Uh, and, you know, again, if you want to talk about where, you know, we were behind the eight ball a little bit, uh, I was in South Carolina. Uh, I didn't have, you know, really any contacts from an investment standpoint. Uh, and South Carolina, where I was, you know, I had to drive a couple hundred miles even to get in front of investors. And so we were in an area where there wasn't a lot of investment. I was someone that even though I had been a, a you know, pretty significant role at another, you know, company that had done well, wasn't really promoted in the space well at that stage. Yeah. So that was really difficult. And the analogy that I always like to give is, uh, when you can't get, you know, when you can't get any girl to go out with you in high school, and then all of a sudden, for whatever reason, the prom queen decides to go out with you. Now everybody wants to date you, and it's been sort of a, a similar process, not rolling in quite that to that extent, but of having to find investors, uh, having to prove to somebody, grab them, and say, "Here's what we're doing. Give us a hundred thousand dollars, even." Yeah. Uh, to that dynamic changing, just you know, six months, a year, year and a half later, after not only you start to get a client base, but you start to get the first domino with someone willing to invest in you but it's hard to get that rock moving uh we're gonna go ahead and take a uh, quick break here uh you're listening to 1200 wai uh, this is cyber talk radio and we're talking about uh cliently uh with spencer farber the ceo here who's uh, been in san antonio now for uh just coming up uh, just almost a year almost a year he's nodding at me as we head here uh, into the break uh, if you're listening to us uh, on a podcast we'll skip the news traffic and weather update because uh, we've not figured out yet how to predict the future for when you're going to listen to the podcast to give you the correct news traffic and weather so uh, we will be back here on cyber talk radio uh, to cover some more of this with spencer soon
Welcome back to Cyber Talk Radio. I'm your host, Brett Pyatt, a 20 year internet security veteran. Uh, we're talking lead gen and uh, the difference between sales and marketing and uh, how businesses should talk to businesses and starting up your own business as well, raising some money, what you're going to do with it. So if uh, you're in your car right now and uh, you're going to want to continue to listen, uh, you can do that by switching uh, off of the radio in your vehicle to the iHeartMedia streaming app. Uh, or uh, you can check us out on our website at www.cybertalkradio.com. Uh, this program will go uh, up on our website on Tuesday, May 21st, uh, or it'll also be out there on uh, any of your favorite podcasting apps. If you have a favorite podcasting service that you listen uh, to content on, and if you uh, cannot find our program on that service, reach out to us on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, let us know. We will fix that, and we will get you a CyberTalk Radio t-shirt. And uh, for the entrepreneurial folks, yes, you can start your own podcasting service for a t-shirt. Uh, there's a lot of podcasting services out there. It's its own challenge. Uh, building an audience, as we mentioned a little bit in the first time, is hard. And you're trying to build an audience for a podcast. You also have to build an audience for your own podcasting service to get people to listen to podcasts on you. So uh, there's some type of inception going on there. Uh, our producer's got a, a good laugh going from this. They were in a highly soundproof studio booth here. Uh, you can see a picture of what our studio does look like. If you would like to see a still photo of Spencer and I, uh, you can watch this program on YouTube. No, we're not doing live video now. Maybe we should. As you mentioned, it'll make, it would make us more real and genuine. Uh, it also make the editing work much more difficult. So not coming anytime soon. Uh, maybe if we, we up the budget or we actually start uh, selling ads here on CyberTalk Radio. Uh, right now we don't sell any ads because... Like it's 11 p.m. on a Saturday night. I don't really want to know what type of commercials we, we may need to run for that audience. I guess we do have cybersecurity and entrepreneurs. Maybe we could find some fun things there that fit in with that. But in the absence of that, we'll uh, not do live video on YouTube, keep our production budget uh, reasonable, and uh, have some fun getting good content out there on the Internet. And on to AM radio because uh, this really helps us reach a, a diverse group of folks Uh as, as, as much as uh, you came here and, and plugged into the startup ecosystem about a year ago, there's a whole bunch of people here that don't even know the startup ecosystem exists still. Uh, but maybe they found out about it tonight. Yeah. I mean, I feel like, uh, you know, Active Capital is who I've worked with specifically and starting to understand how tight knit uh, the group is in, in San Antonio. Uh, it, it was a lot bigger than I even realized initially. Like, I had never heard of uh, any sort of tech scene in San Antonio. When I first came down here, uh, I mentioned earlier, I visited Geekdom, uh, and that yeah. sort of opened my eyes. It was like a, obviously a very micro version of what's going on uh, in my visit to San Francisco. But uh, even just let's talk about Active Capital, uh, you know, our main investment partner led by the, the two Pats and Kat Dyson, in that right now, you know, when I started there, I was one guy by myself in an office, uh, I think next to one other company of two people. And now there's about 20 people. Yeah, I heard y'all are building out another floor. Uh, Pat is building out... Right now, I uh, just saw the tour, was I think, late last week. So he's, I don't know if you want to call it a mini geekdom or, or what, but yeah. he's, uh, he's got a pretty keen vision of what he's doing over there as well. Oh, it's, it's great to see. So um, we saw an announcement. Um, so you were talking about kind of getting your, your first bit of seed funding, uh, but now you've, you've raised uh, $1 million. Yeah, we can all picture the, uh, the video from there. Yeah, it still is a real big yeah, actual yeah. amount of money unless you want to dominate the world. Then a million bucks isn't going to get you there, but it can get you on the way. Exactly. So we do want to dominate the world, but you've got to, you know, crawl before you walk, walk before you run. Uh, and so, you know, going through this process with another company, uh, it, you know, it's a big step, right? So I look at when you get that series A, uh, you've essentially made it as a, as a real company. But what that million dollars does is that it gives you the chance to actually build out on your full vision because until that point, you really can't, you know, you can sort of just do enough to get enough clients interested in what your vision is. But that million allows you to construct a simple vision, the building blocks for that, that vision. Yeah. And so we're, excited that the next six to nine months we're going to be growing aggressively but really making our product what we wanted it to be you know two years ago uh, and then we look at the year of 2020 where you can start really doing some exciting and interesting you know new things with tech but this allows us to sort of fill in the gaps of uh, getting our product to where we always wanted it to be yeah then one of the analogies i, I use and then yeah out there if you're founding your own startup don't be afraid to do a little bit of the wizard of oz so when you're, you're out at, at early seed stage or you're bootstrapping the thing yourself, you paint enough of the vision for the, the folks that you're having a conversation to. And it, the delivery of that vision behind the scenes might be 
he has you and your wife involved in there or whatever else. It may be you scrambling around doing a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't scale. It's totally manual. It's not what the thing's ultimately going to be. Um, I mean, you go back to some of the, the famous stories. I mean, it's like uh, Jeff Bezos wasn't buying books for the initial Amazon. He he would sell the book on the website, and he'd run over to a bookstore, buy the book, put it in a box, and ship it to somebody because the bookstore that he would buy the book from didn't ship stuff back then. Or even if they did, their website was so terrible. Um, so he would list books for sale on there that they didn't have an inventory initially when they first got started because he didn't have enough money to buy the inventory. Yep. Uh, I mean, we have a similar story, um, you know, just in terms of uh, what makes us a little bit different is the uh, multiple ways you can engage. And we talked about the physical handwritten notes, for example, yeah. and gift cards. So how many of those did you and your wife handwrite? My wife uh, will take the credit for most of those because yeah. my handwriting is not good uh, so enough. You wouldn't want it sent out Maintaining for me. product quality. I like it. Correct. But at the same time, I will say that I spent a lot of time in the early days uh, at UPS. And yeah searching Walmarts or Targets for the right gift cards that, you know, we wanted to make sure our clients had the access to at least a certain amount of the right ones. So we didn't keep them until, you know, we needed them that day. So definitely have gone through that, that process uh, and understand what that's like. And, you know, our goal was, Hey, if it does well enough, which it has, then you start to hire people yeah. uh, to do that. So that's good. So, uh, yeah, but are, are you hiring more folks? Is there like a jobs page on your website or where, where would they go if they, you know, like what we've talked about and want to be involved in the tech scene here and really love what you're you're working on right now so we actually did just add a uh a jobs page to our our site maybe a couple weeks ago so we're looking for a couple of you know roles part-time full-time maybe uh for the piece we just talked about handwritten notes etc we filled you know one or two of those but really the biggest thing we're looking for right now and what you'll find on our jobs page is development help yeah so we've spent about the last year uh really painfully from my side from being ready to sell a product building our integrations which are now amazing for a few different crms salesforce hubspot and pipe drive and all the things that nobody sees but rebuilding uh, almost our entire application uh, with our new cto his name is ue lee uh, he was actually uh, recommended to us um, he had worked with our investment company active capital met him a little over a year ago while i was in san antonio my first time uh, we hit it off recruited him came aboard and he spent a lot of his time uh, building that back up. And so while the most of rest of our team has been you know, busy on our integrations, he's been doing all those things from the back end to make it a stable application, which is where we finally are, but now we're ready to go to that next level. Uh, and so we're looking for development help, front end, back end, full stack. But the biggest thing for us is quality over quantity. And you know, just sort of uh, giving a peek behind the curtains, if you wanna you know, talk about the issues that we've had uh, why it took us, you know, and a lot of companies would look at like, hey, to get a million dollars in year three is, is pretty good. Um, but we feel that we could have gotten there quicker uh, if the development uh, was a little tighter. And so we want to make sure every person we bring onto our team right now is the right fit, uh, super high quality, because we're at a place where, yes, we move a little slower without those people, but it hurts us more. And we've learned from those mistakes to bring in the wrong person. So development uh, is definitely something where we'd love to find the right fit for one or two people in San Antonio. Yeah. So if you're, you're out there thinking, you know what, this uh, sounds like a community ecosystem I want to be part of, uh, go check out Cliently. Uh, if you uh, are listening uh, to this live, check out our website at www.cybertalkradio.com. We'll have links to everything uh, up there on Tuesday, May 21st. If you follow our Twitter feed or Facebook, uh, we'll have links to a recap blog post that'll uh, cover uh, everything and provide uh, ways to get out there and, and uh, get in contact with uh, Spencer and uh, Huey and the team there to uh, talk about one of those development jobs. So uh, as you, you go through now and, and you've uh, you've been here for a year now in our ecosystem, you said you've kind of seen lots of growth, um, seen a bunch of stuff going on. Um, it, it's one of these uh, is and you've been out to San Francisco and visited there before. Um, I think I, I lived there uh, for years. I'm going out there on a trip again this week. Um, I think there's stuff that they're doing well. Um, I think there's stuff that, that they are really struggling with for, for folks here that are trying to help make our ecosystem better. Are there any, any things that we need to, to work on? Or are there any things that you're like, Oh man, I hope we don't end up this way. Uh, I mean, I haven't been to San Francisco enough to really, you know, understand the ebbs and flows of the community. 
Um, but I will say this. I mean, Austin right now is is become maybe second to San Francisco to, and Texas. Yeah, exa- exactly. But as far as San Antonio, I mean, as I mentioned, I've seen growth just in the year I've been here. But here's what I really think is going to happen and, and have to happen for it to grow uh, is essentially you're going to have a few of these startups and knock on wood. Hopefully it's one, ours is one of them. Exactly. That, that have a really high growth rate. Uh, and then from there, all of a sudden people come to you and that's how you attract talent. Yeah. You know, Rackspace was always sort of the hub here uh, in Austin. I can't name the companies. I'm sure yeah. you could. Oh, you can. You just did. I don't know them off the top of my head, but oh, yeah, it's but, Dell. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Just gigantic. Yeah. I mean, and then like you've had IBM and some other folks have had research offices there, national instruments, lots of folks, AMD going way back, but really it's Dell that became one of the, 10 biggest tech companies in the world and really spawned a lot of what's going on up in that Austin ecosystem. But ultimately, and as you know, talent breeds talent. And yeah. so when you get a few companies here that really sort of put their name on the map, people will come to them and then that will be a domino effect. And I think that's the dynamic that's going to change here in San Antonio. And they're already on a good start just by having some exciting companies here that's how you, it's no different than with my company internally. You look to constantly get your MRR up every month. And as you, you know, have, you know, more and more good companies that are willing to come here or that start their company here, you're going to have a few of those that really shine. And that's going to, I think, change the dynamic of the community. Yeah. And I think we're, we're seeing some of that stuff already over the course of the, the last uh, couple of years where uh, there's businesses here that I know have more than doubled in size. Um, and doubled in size already starting from a, a good size. And the for any CEOs listening that are, are not, you don't have uh, an office here in the, the downtown area or uh, your uh, companies are not participating in the community, um, you can be in San Antonio and run a great business um, and not be part of the community. But I think if you really want to take things to the next level, be able to find that top quality developer, be able to leverage and take advantage of the relationships, uh, then join tech block, um, get involved, go to have someone at your company be responsible for going to the events. It's just like the chamber of commerce. If you're not in the tech world and, and you're out there trying to figure out where do I go to meet people to discuss business stuff, pick one of the chamber of commerce around town, go join it. Um, but if the, uh, the more that we get folks here in the, the kind of consolidated tech district here in San Antonio, the, the more it all feeds off of each other. Cause it's much easier by the way. Uh, and this is one everyone's always afraid. It's like, if I go down there, there's 20 other companies, all my employees could go work for. Yeah. Well, guess what? They're going to be willing to come work for you, uh, because they know that you're not on an Island by yourself. It's really scary for people to go commit their life to go work for, for somebody. If they go, you know, if this doesn't work out, I'm there alone and there's nowhere else to go. They'll actually even stay. Um, you'll have better employee retention. Like you look at San Francisco, um, even out there, the, everyone talks that people change jobs every two years, but not really, um, a little bit, but not, not as much as, as the stereotypes I think talk about. And you look at cities like New York for financial services and, um, all the other hubs around the, the world, um, being part of a community, people are more likely to stay there and enjoy it. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's accurate. I mean, it's one of those things, big fish in small pond or opposite. And here, I think you're in sort of a almost middle ground there, which yeah. is, a, I think is perfect. You know, there is, we're looking to get more talent here, but there is some, you know, again, yeah. I was in an area in South Carolina, which just unfortunately was not a big tech scene and really wasn't growing. Um, I was in the Myrtle beach area uh, and here so you can great actually place to retire and play golf. Absolutely. Yes. Anyway, not necessarily uh, a ton of action when you're, when you're doing a tech startup, which is, you know, what helped bring me to San Antonio, but you can see that, you know, San Antonio is in that, that middle area right now and it is growing each month and so it's one of those things that you're right if you bring people here uh you know of course they're going to have anywhere they'll have a few more options but it wouldn't be like it would be in san francisco Uh, and it'd be somewhere the cost of living also is a lot less to be able to put your roots down yeah yeah you if you would not be in san francisco in order for you to be able to execute on the same vision you'd be raising a three million dollar round instead of a million dollar round Exactly. Maybe even more. It's in, it's insane there. Yeah. yeah. No, it's a, uh, it's its own challenging place for sure. I mean, I think, and this is where, like, if you're out there and you're building a startup and you're going to build a B two B company, um, 
places like San Francisco are really challenging. If you're going to build a massive B2C platform business, like some of the ones that just went public, Uber or Lyft or Facebook, if you go back a few years now, Twitter, uh, you've got Snapchat in Southern California, those type of things where you're going to reach an audience of billions and you're going to have it or, uh, like uh, some of the ones that Facebook acquired, they had 60 employees and a $20 billion valuation. You can put those 60 people anywhere on earth. But if you're going to build a B2B business um, and you're going to work to a million and a $10 million and maybe a $100 million revenue run rate and build a great company, and even many of the B2B companies IPO at $100 million of revenue, it's starting to become much more challenging to do that. Um, on either of the coasts if you as the founders want to own any of the company by the time you get there. Yeah, and I mean, actually, we started in Panadoc, our first sales office. This was actually kind of a proud moment in Myrtle Beach, even though that company's in San Francisco. And when we had, when we came to that point for Cliently, Panadoc had just given up that office a couple months earlier. We took that office over. But the key thing as well is, you know, the development talent is, is really tough to find. And a lot of that is in, in San Francisco, but I think the cost of living is something that uh, it, you can use to bring people to this area. But a lot of the other types of talent, uh, you know, when you think about the tech scene, are not in San Francisco, but you do need those people at tech companies, sales people, marketing people, customer success people, etc. cetera. Uh, and the fact that you can literally get three to one here and the quality is just as good, if not better, uh, because out there, there's not enough people. Yeah. Here, there is, uh, is another key point I think in terms of you know thinking about and something that I thought a lot about when bringing my company out here. Yeah. So did you you go up to South by Southwest in Austin this year? I wasn't able to make it this year, but it's on the uh, yeah it's on the calendar for next year. Yeah, it's one of the the interesting things as well because that brings fifty thousand plus people into to Texas every year. Um, and most of them just go to Austin. This year we had a startup uh, bus tour that came down here uh, through the San Antonio area, um, and I think it's it's helpful to do things like that. Is just even if you go out in, in the Bay Area and you check it out and you've never been out there before, um, San Francisco's distinctly different from the um, peninsula, which is different from the, the the west side of the South Bay with Mountain View and Palo Alto versus. Um, as you head around into Santa Clara and Sunnyvale and Fremont and the rest of that whole area or out to the East Bay, um, it's San Antonio and Austin are, are two distinctly different places, complementary, um, but definitely distinctly different. Um, and so don't judge the entire state of Texas by Austin. And you may love Austin, and, and, and I do, and um, I actually love San Antonio as well. Um, I even like San Francisco as much as I tease it a little bit. Um, it, it's, it's Most of San Francisco's pain is self-inflicted. Uh, that's the way I feel about it. Uh, so as uh, you you guys go from here, um, what goals do you have as you, as you talk to your investors and um, you've done these integrations? Uh, what goals do you have for yourself and, and how do you set those as an entrepreneur? Because it's different. Like most people, before they decide to become an entrepreneur, you've got a boss and your boss sets your goals for you every year. Now you've got a, investors, but your investors still want you to set your own goals. They'll tell you if they like them, but they generally won't just directly set them for you. You know, the hardest part was actually setting those goals when we were first trying to figure out how to get investment because you didn't even have a fully built out product yet. So you didn't even understand once it was built how it was going to catch on necessarily and saying, okay, here's where we expect to be in three to five years. That was tough. Where we are right now, uh, at least personally, I have a very clear vision. Um, right now, we're going to look to get hyper growth to get us to a level uh, that gets you to Series A. Uh, and then from there, we have, you know, sort of a number uh, that we want to look at to get us not necessarily to Series B, but to get us to that range, uh, at least from an MRR perspective. And, you know, that's something where, again, going back to that predictable revenue model, et cetera, uh, as long as you can get your, the right product, the positioning down uh, and make sure it's keyed into the right target. Uh, you know, we have a pretty clear vision of that and we yeah. have very, very aggressive goals because you got to remember uh, for about 10 months and my background, um, you know, is sales, not being able to fully put our product out there because it wasn't able to basically do the vision that I had in my mind. And now it is, um, I was chomping at the bit. So now I'm ready to go before I even bring on any other sales hires. Uh, I'm going to be handholding this process for the next three or four months to essentially uh, get us to where you know a team of five or six would in a span of 
of nine months. So of, you you uh, no you sleep. you uh, gave your your wife a kiss and and on the cheek, uh, said goodbye to your puppy, and um, you're going to be uh, selling here for the next six months. Come by the active capital office on uh, Saturday or Sunday. I'll be the only one there. So, yeah. Yeah, but it's again, it's an exciting time, and you know sometimes people look at hard work as they look at it different ways, and I don't look at hard work just to do it just because. I look at it, this gets us over that hump because working like this isn't necessarily efficient. But you get us to that stage, and then all of a sudden we talked about you get a million, five million potentially opens up the resources to really have a repeatable process already in place. And that's the biggest thing also I would tell yeah. a lot of tech startup founders that don't have the sales experience where they want to bring in their first sales hire. Unless you're bringing in somebody that is a director uh, that you know, or VP level, you don't want to bring in that first hire. And the biggest reason is you don't have – all those things that we talked about yet, market fit, targets figured out, et cetera, yeah. and you're setting somebody else up to fail. And you have to understand and learn that piece at the beginning, not because you'll ever have to become the best salesperson out there, but because you have to understand where your product fits, and that's the only way to do it. Yeah, you, you have to have somebody that can can deal with the ambiguity and can build the system out themselves because no two companies – are going to need to have exactly the same sales process, just like no two companies have exactly the same software development process or tech stack or anything else. Um, every area inside your company has it's going to need to be built out for your business. Um, and yeah, it's a don't underhire in any of your key leadership roles. So that's one of that's a, a great tip here to uh, to get out to the the audience. Um, and I, I think there's a tendency of that like I you can just go hire somebody um, who was was selling um, cars at a car dealership last week, but like they didn't understand that like people show up in the car lot because there's a whole process to get them on the lot. And they, all of the other things that they had there, a quote tool and a pricing tool and a management escalation, all those things don't exist anymore if they're your first salesperson all by themselves. And I mean, I guess the way I would think about it is this, you know, coming from someone who doesn't have the tech background or the engineering background, I'm very much a product guy, but not an engineer, is that, you know, if you are coming from that side and you're comparing, you know, somebody that's a level one API developer and think they could come in and do full stack and architecture at a level to build a, you know, a world class proc. That's essentially saying, I think I can get, uh, you know, anybody at sales to create a process. And there's a reason that some of these, you know, really high level sales guys and gals, you know, overall make hundreds of thousands a year because there's a very, very different it's a different title and role uh, yeah. than just selling a product. No, for sure. Um, and yeah, if if you don't have experienced people to receive those leads, um, and you spend money on marketing to get them in, uh, then you you're actually wasting. Uh, yeah, it's just bad. And it goes down the line to everything from getting your pricing right, getting yeah. your target market correct, figuring out how you're going to get it out there, how you you know give the perception of who your product helps and why. So yeah, there's a lot of pieces. And like I said, we were lucky that we didn't have those issues, but we had them from the development side. So no. we learned our, our lessons and took our looks just like everybody yeah, else. Yeah, every, everyone has them somewhere. And if they don't, as, as I mentioned it during our opening, they're lying. And I would love to have you on the program so I can grill you to find out. We did, we, well, I will close here with one thought. We're um, heading into um, our runoff elections here in the San Antonio area. So if you're listening uh, to this on 1200 WAI, we will have a, a runoff for our local elections. Uh, coming up and we had a bear county election commissioner uh jackie kyle allen on the program and so she's one i, I did grill her for an hour to make sure our elections were safe and secure here you can listen to that on our, our past episodes at www.cybertalkradio.com or out there on uh, any of your favorite podcasting services uh yeah and and i i told her before we we spoke that i was going to grill her for a whole hour and if i asked a question where like we didn't actually have stuff secured she could just stop the program and call her team her team does a great job. Um, love it. Yeah. It's a, it's a big topic out there these days. And it feels like we just finished the last presidential season. We're already on our way back into a new one again. Um, I don't know uh, how this whole national campaigning stuff works, but there is a local election coming up here in June. Uh, get out there, vote, participate, be part of the process, regardless of which side you're on. Um, and know that when you are voting here in San Antonio, uh, in the Bear County area, uh, where they, it's the home of 1200 WAI, uh, you're voting on election platform that uh, your radio host here uh, believes is secure. And I have a reasonable background in this stuff, and uh, I, Jackie answered some questions uh, very well uh, that you can listen to her personally on the program. 
and our conversations about it. So thank you very much, Spencer, for uh, joining us on CyberTalk Radio this week, and uh, welcome to our San Antonio's tech startup scene. Thank you, Brett. Appreciate it.